centurion. When, let me just, when he declared, or he made a statement, and the statement is such a pertinent and powerful one, because the Bible says, this happened immediately after, it says when Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost, the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. Then it says, and when the centurion which stood over against him, saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, truly this man was the son of God. <clears throat> now, when we read the gospels, we come to realize that there are many things that transpired at the cross that allowed or that built up to a point, that built up to a point that would allow this man to make this utterance. In other words, first, as we read the text and as we read the verses prior and we compare gospel with gospel, we come to realize that at that point in time, that point in time, there was darkness over the earth and that the sun had refused to shine. In actual fact, this was the first time in his so-called job description that he experienced something of such a nature. And, and furthermore, furthermore, the Gospel of Mark does not tell us this, but when you compare the other Gospels, you will actually find out that when Jesus so cried and he died, there was an earthquake that took place. It shook shook the earth. So much so, I was reading some commentary on in Desire of Ages. Desire of Ages says when that earthquake took place, people were laying prostrate on the ground, whether it was priests, whether it was, it was, it was soldiers, those who were onlookers, they laid prostrate at the violent earthquake that took place at the death of Jesus. Is somebody with me? Um, so to the centurion, Something is happening here that he cannot understand because the effects of this man's cry and the effects of this man's crucifixion is so potent that it stirs him internally. <clears throat> but there's something else that in reading in the, the reading of Desire of Ages that actually um, struck me uh, uh, deeper than what I understood this to be. Because we are taught that, even though it's not mentioned in scripture, Spirit of Prophecy teaches us that when Jesus died, his face lit up. Just before he died, his face lit up and it shone brighter than the sun. And when he gave up the ghost, his head went down onto his chest, it went down and he died. Now, you tell me if what the centurion has seen does not warrant an utterance from his lips to testify that the one who is hanging on that cross is the son of God. Now, in that day, in that day, they, when Christ was crucified, there were three men who declared their faith in Jesus who openly declared their faith. Number one, it was the Roman centurion. Number two, it was Simon, who carried the cross of Jesus. When Jesus could not carry the cross, he, 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 <coughs> he fainted under the weight of the cross. And Simon was called, and he carried the cross up to Calvary for Christ. But then also, it was the thief who hung on the side of the cross. These men, differing from one another, experienced Christ in a different way in the great picture of Calvary. In other words, they all had a tailor-made experience for themselves. Today, I want to share with you that in our conversion and in our sanctification, it is the, it is, it is, it is the will of God that we should come into contact with our Savior continually. But however, because God is so great, everyone's experience has been tailor-made for them. In other words, God knows what experiences we need 
what circumstances he needs to allow in our lives so that we will be able to have an encounter with Jesus. So three men, different experiences, but it shows the power of the gospel. Regardless of where they came from, regardless of where they were born, <clears throat> regardless of their background, God gave them a tailor-made experience so that they can encounter Jesus. And, and this is not only, and this is my point, it is not only at the point of conversion, it is at the point at, at, at every day's leading of God where we are brought into divinely ordained circumstances that will help us to encounter Jesus on a regular basis. So much so that this week of prayer is one of them. Hallelujah. Can somebody testify? This week of prayer is one of them. God has ordained the circumstance in such a way that we can encounter Christ once again. And so, beloved, all these things that have transpired right before his eyes produced some kind of conviction internally because he had never ever in his entire job description, having done what he did on a regular basis, uh, people being crucified, as he experienced someone like Jesus and the events that surround this man. Now, he makes the utterance. <coughs> sorry. He makes the utterance. And he says, truly, this man was the son of God. Now, this statement is dual in character. And let me explain further or elaborate. It's dual in character. Number one, it is a statement of realization. And number two, it is a penitent confession. It encapsulates both that of realization and number two, that of confession. So that when he said truly, this man was the son of God, it was a confession, but also it was a realization. Now, <clears throat> to build on this, sorry, <clears throat> to build on this, it is only as we realize who Jesus is that we will come to confessing who we are. Are we together? Are we together? When we realize who he is, <clears throat> then we will be begin to understand who we are. And this is the God that we serve. You see, when we look at ourselves, we will not realize who we are. We need to look outside of ourselves in order that we may experience the conviction necessary to make the proper utterances. And so, let me, let, let me elaborate further. It is as we look and realize the holiness of Jesus that we will confess ourselves as sinners. Come on, somebody. Is somebody with me? When we realize that he is holy and, 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 and we focus on him, we will see who we are, that we are sinners. When we realize that he is, he is love, it is only then that we will come to a confession that we are selfish, that we are lost. It is when we realize how humble he is that we will confess how proud we are. So today, one of my points that I'd like to emphasize in all of this is that it would never have been possible for this man to make this utterance had it not been for the ordained circumstances that God has allowed. And number two, number two, for him realizing who Jesus is. Because looking upon the cross, before Jesus died, his face lit up and it shone brighter than the sun. Imagine, imagine that can you, I, I cannot picture it. The, the, the divinity of Jesus as if it's the divinity is flashing through his face. 
but yet at that point in time, he's dying for the sins of the world. It bred so much thought in the mind of the centurion that he realized that the one on the cross is more than just a simple man. Are we together? Because, let me share this, with every other crucifixion that has been, that has been taking place in his life, never has he seen this before. And today, you know what? This is what we need to do. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> we need to ask God to cause his face to shine upon us. It is only, it is only as the face of Jesus shines upon the sinner that he will realize who God is and realize who he is. And today we must pray, God, give me a revelation of yourself. Let your face shine upon me today so that I may be able to declare that you are the son of God and that I may not only do so verbally, but that I may show it through my life. And so the statement is dual in character. Now, as we progress, as we progress, um, surely with all these things gathering within his mind and within his heart, the Holy Spirit was working. And as the Holy Spirit worked, there, were, there, was, there was an internal press inside of him, an internal working and movement on his heart, on his mind, and on his heart. So much so that he, he, he could not contain the conviction. In actual fact, when you read Desire of Ages, Desire of Ages says, Desire of Ages says, when he made the statement, it was made in no whispering tones. Hello? It was made in no whispering tones. In other words, he did not try to conceal his confession of Christ. He did not try to conceal it. He made it public and everybody looked around. These averages, everybody looked around to see who made the statement. Now, this is what I want to share. There's, there's some time ago where I heard a, a, a statement. Um, I can't remember which preacher made it. Um, where he talks about this internal conviction. Uh, and he talks about discipleship because his internal conviction became an external confession. His internal conviction became an external confession. And the preacher says this, there is no such thing as a secret disciple. They are contradiction in terms. Uh, it's either the secrecy will kill the discipleship or the discipleship will kill the secrecy. And in this day, at this point in time, the internal conviction was so strong that he made it publicly known that this was the son of God. And while this was a realization, this was a penitent confession, I'm thinking to myself that that day was a day of change in his life. It is only, it is only as we come to the cross of Calvary to behold the God that loves us who dies on that cross for a lost world, that when we, <clears throat> when we behold who he is, that we will fall upon the rock. That we will fall upon the rock. That, that we will realize I am a sinner. I am selfish. I am proud. I am this. And regardless of rank, regardless of rank or station, the cross stands as the summit of salvation's appeal to the human heart. And today, today, as we go forth in this day, now I know this issue of secrecy and discipleship, if we embrace secrecy and we don't, I'm not saying we must conscientiously make it, make it public, like go and show, oh yes, yes, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. But the reality is when there's internal conviction, it will become an external confession in our lives. But some people claim to be Christians, but they don't even pray when they're in a restaurant. Hello, is somebody here? Yes, I'm a Christian. Okay. Uh, uh, the, the food is brought, but I'm not going to pray. I'm a Christian, but I don't want everybody to see. Hello? So much so, so much so, that we, we, we try to be the Christians who, 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 who bow to the statue, who, who, bowed, who bowed to the statue, not like the Hebrew boys who stood up 
uh, uh, you've often heard the sermon preached that says a lot of people could have just went down and made as if they tied their, 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 their shoelaces or, or make as if they're scratching their legs. Hello? And sometimes we do that. We want to be secret disciples, but it is a contradiction in terms. It's either the discipleship will kill the secrecy or the secrecy will kill the discipleship. But in that day, his internal conviction manifested itself publicly. And this is the point. Internal conviction must manifest itself publicly. <coughs> in actual fact, we have so much truth that sometimes the conviction gets, it, 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 it comes to us, but we suppress it. We don't want that conviction to manifest itself in our lives. But God wants it to materialize. God wants it to materialize because it's for our well-being. To suppress it is to dull our consciences. The best thing to do is at the height, at the height of the conviction, is to allow it to manifest itself publicly. And so when this, guy, this, this man said, truly this man was the son of God, I believe in my heart that that was the turning point in his life. It was a turning point for him. I want to move on, on to our two last points. Um, if we do, as we read this um, portion of scripture, we realize that there's no details with regards to this man. Absolutely no details. We are only told that he's a centurion. Um, <clears throat> we know that the centurion is a captain of a hundred soldiers. So he he was in a leadership position, so to say. <coughs> Sorry. But we are not told, listen carefully, we are not told his name. Furthermore, we are not told whether he's married. Hello? We are not told whether uh, he has children. And sometimes these details are <laughs> nice to include. Hello? Oh, uh, the married man. So many children. Uh, you, you, you get what I'm saying? Uh, but, it, but it seems that the Bible omits this detail. Because that detail, though nice, though noble, that detail is not nearly as important as the moment or the detail that he is now going to, en uh, uh, that he's now going to encounter the God of the universe. Because you see, that detail does not matter so much so when it comes to our personal salvation. Because when it comes to salvation, it is a one-on-one a, a -on -one matter. Because then when it comes to salvation, it's, it's, it's God and myself. It is, not, it is not God and my wife or God and, and, and my children. It is God and I. So that in that encounter of divinity, God wants to have a one-on-one -on -one with you and I. And that is what happened with that centurion. God wanted to have a one-on-one -on -one with him. God, God wanted to, 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 to interrogate his sinfulness so that he must answer from the conviction that is built up inside of him. And, 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 and as the love of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God interrogated his soul, he could not contain himself. He had to make that utterance. Truly, this man was the son of God. And so, yes, yes, the details are nice to mention. But let me say this, beloved. The greatest detail is the emphasis that we have to encounter our God on a regular basis. This is the emphasis. And as I draw to a close, when you check... Um, Strong's definition of the centurion. It says a leader or a Roman soldier who is in charge of a hundred soldiers under him. In other words, he, he was one who could call shots. He could give orders. He was in a leadership position. And, and being in a leadership position, he had X amount of individuals under him to which he could yield his control, to which he could speak and they would listen. So here we find a captain of 100, 
coming into contact with the captain of the universe. Hello, somebody. He, he, he only over, he, 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 he was overseeing 100 individuals. But the one whom he came into contact with oversees the universe. Are we together? And here the captain of 100 now meets the captain of the universe and he must bow to the majesty of the one who is hanging on the cross. I say, hallelujah. This is the point that we must come to. When we are in leadership positions, we must look to the one who is greater, the one who is higher, and we will bow down. Our hearts will be humbled as we come into contact with the captain of the universe to know that the one hanging on the cross keeps the universe together. <coughs> that, that in and of itself will humble us, will teach us that there is one higher, there is one greater. And so I close off with this, with this thought. And remember that later we're going to continue with the rest of this statement, this utterance. But this is what I want to say as I close off. This, this man who was frequently engaged in battle and warfare, who conquered nation after nation, as Rome ruled the world at that time. They conquered from length to length and from breath, from place to place, from at length and at breath, they conquered. Many were slain by the Roman sword, a sword that expressed the evidence of showing no mercy. But today, today, in this verse, as it is, today, the Roman sword centurion stands slain by the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. May God bless us. Amen. Amen. Wow, Fundis. Thank you so much, Fundis, for that amazing um, exposition of the Bible you've shared with us. Amen. Amen. 